Please note that filming text on the whiteboard requires extremely bright studio lighting. Subsequently, sunglasses were worn during the filming of this video to prevent damage to my retinas. A note on how to use these sessions. Jot down the notes as we go, so we'll help you learn the material in a more interactive way and you can use in a study note later. Also, in the small chance that the discrepancy arises between the professor's notes and mine, always go with your professor. They're the one grading you. Lastly, any examples or analogies used in the session are not meant to support or criticize politics, religion, or lifestyle. They're merely learning tools to help understand the material. Alright, guys and girls. It's time to get cracking. All right, you guys, so today we're going to be talking about free radicals. But before we get into free radicals, I first want to tell you why it's important to study these things. And free radicals are important for two main reasons in OCHEM. Number one, free radicals are important because they give us one way to make things called alkyl halides. And alkyl halides are very important compounds in organic chemistry. We use them all the time in many different types of reactions. You've actually seen these before. Let me give you one example of an alkyl halide. Let's just say CH3Br, for example. This is an alkyl halide. Why is this called an alkyl halide? Well, hey, CH3, this is an alkyl group. So this is an alkyl group. And bromine, this is a halogen. So we call this an alkyl halide. These are also known as halo alkanes, which is basically just flipping these back and forth. Okay, so halo means halogen, alkane, alkyl group. So it means you have a halogen on an alkyl group. Same thing here. This is an alkyl group with a halogen on it. The point is, you guys, if you ever see an alkyl group, a carbon group with halogen stuck on it, this is something called an alkyl halide, or also known as a halo alkane. These are very, very important in OCHEM. We use them all the time. Many different types of reactions use alkyl halides. So it's important to know how we make these things called alkyl halides. And free radicals give us one way to make these types of compounds. So very, very useful. Another reason why free radicals is important to study is because they're involved in polymer chemistry. But you're going to find out all about that later in the polymers chapter. For now, I just want to focus on what is a free radical, how you form a free radical, and how you use free radicals to make alkyl halides, okay? So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so just like always, whenever we start a new chapter, let's go ahead and lay the foundation with some general features and then build on top of that with some more details. Let's go ahead and start out with general features first, though. Okay, so first things first, what is a free radical? Let's go ahead and write this down. Okay, so what is a free radical? Well, hey, you guys, free radical to me, this just sounds reactive. This screams, hey, I'm gonna react with something. I'm a radical, okay? So I don't know if it sounds like that to you, but whenever I see free radical, it's like, whoa, this thing's reactive, okay? And this is exactly what a free radical is. This is a highly reactive intermediate. Let's go ahead and write this down. That a free radical, this is a highly reactive intermediate. Okay, so you're going to see three highly reactive intermediates in OCAM. You're going to see full positive charges, which are cations, full negative charges, which are anions, and now free radicals. These are all highly reactive intermediates, okay? So a free radical, this is a highly reactive intermediate. Intermediate meaning that you have to form a free radical. A free radical can't just exist in a bottle somewhere and you just save it somewhere and you use it to start your reaction. You always have to form your free radical and make it as an intermediate in your reaction, okay? So you can never start out with a free radical in your first step. That's what it means is a highly reactive intermediate. It's too unstable to just store somewhere and save it for the beginning of your reaction. You have to actually make this free radical when you want to do your reaction. So this is a highly reactive intermediate. What makes it so reactive is that it has an unpaired electron. So a free radical is a highly reactive intermediate 
with an unpaired electron. Unpaired electron. We know that all electrons want to be in pairs, right? You guys, like they want to be in bonds or they want to be in lone pairs, right? These free radicals are really reactive because they are unpaired electrons. It's just a lone electron by itself. We know that electrons all want to exist in pairs. They want to group up, okay? So nobody wants to exist by themselves. They all want to have a partner. It's the same thing with free radicals. These are really reactive because they're looking for a partner for their lone electron, their unpaired electron, okay? Okay, so if you ever see an atom that has an unpaired electron, it has a lone electron just by itself, that's a free radical. Let's go ahead and look at the structure of one of these guys. Okay, so technically any atom with a lone electron on it is considered a free radical. For example, if you have a bromine with a lone electron on it, it'd be considered a bromine free radical. If it was an oxygen, it'd be an oxygen free radical. Or if it's a carbon, it would be a carbon free radical, okay? So hey, what types of compounds did we say free radicals are used to make? Alkyl halides, right? Carbon groups with halogens attached. So hey, let me go ahead and just show you a carbon free radical for example here, okay? Okay, so what I've drawn up here is a carbon free radical. Why is this a carbon free radical? Well, it's because this carbon has a lone electron on it. This is a lone unpaired electron, a free radical. It's very, very reactive. It's a highly reactive intermediate because it has an unpaired electron. This electron is gonna do whatever it can to meet up and pair with another electron, okay? So go ahead and take a minute, copy this down exactly like this, and then we'll talk about it a little bit more. Okay, so what are we looking at here? Let's ignore this blue p orbital for right now. So ignore this part, and let's just look at this carbon that is single bonded to one, two, three things, three methyl groups here to be exact. Okay, so the important point is this carbon is single bonded to one, two, three things. It's making three single, three sigma bonds. And hey, you guys, what's the hybridization of something that's making three single, three sigma bonds? This is gonna be sp2, right? Let's go and write that down. Something that's making three single bonds, like this carbon right here, this is gonna be sp2 hybridized. And hey, what's the shape of something that's sp2 hybridized. What's the shape of this compound right here? Trigonal planar, right? You guys, sp2, that means it's going to have a trigonal planar shape to it. Okay, so this compound is sp2 hybridized and trigonal planar. That means that this group right here, this group, and this group, these are all in the same flat plane, okay? So that means that this carbon is bonded to one, two, three things, and these are all in the same flat plane. So don't let these wedges and dashes mix you up. These are all just single bonds, but I'm drawing it like this to show you that, hey, so one CH3 is pointing to the back, one CH3 is pointing to the front, and the other CH3 is pointing to the side like this, so that these are, all in one flat plane, like this. So it's like a flat plane, flat plane, like this. And then there's a p orbital that's perpendicular to this flat plane, okay? So it's perpendicular, meaning that right here, this is the p orbital, and down here, this is the p orbital. So it's gonna be above and below this plane, this flat trigonal planar plane, okay? So um, don't let these that wedges and dashed lines mix you up. These are all just single bonds. This is just here to give you some perspective to show you that this, this, and this are all in the same plane, and this p orbital is perpendicular to these three things, okay?